Dear family and friends in Christ Jesus our Lord, may his joy and his hope, may his peace fill your hearts this day and each day. Amen. Please bow your heads and join me in prayer. Lord, we give thanks to you for the graciousness of your love and your mercy that is new each morning. We thank you, O Lord, that you have sent your Son, Christ Jesus, who has called us by the gospel, given us eternal life. We pray, O Lord, that we would always bring honor to your holy name, living out our faith, obeying your commands, sharing your love with others. Lord, we ask that you would bless our time together and that you would be with us always. In the name of Jesus, amen. For many Christians, Amazing Grace is one of their favorite hymns or is one that, you know, regardless of denomination, regardless of upbringing, is a hymn that has spoken to their hearts or spoken to their lives. I suspect for many of you sitting here this morning that hearing the words of Amazing Grace even now are, are playing through your minds as you think about those away, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Words that have comforted many Christians throughout the years. Words that have been sung at countless funerals. Millions, if not billions, of Christians have heard those words, have sung those words, and know the, known the hope and comfort of God's grace and mercy. I don't know if you know the author of those words. His name was John Newton. He was actually an Anglican priest. Again, I don't know if you know his background either, but he wasn't always an Anglican priest. In fact, John Newton actually came from a pretty difficult background, a hard life. By the age of his seventh birthday, right before that, his mom died of tuberculosis. Not long after that, by age 11, he became part of a, the, a crew of a merchant ship. But that didn't last long for him because by, uh, that merchant ship was captured by the Royal Navy and he was pressed into naval service. This certainly was not his favorite thing because he tried to abandon the crew of that naval ship. Well, that was not a pleasing thing. So the captain took him in front of over 300 crew members, and they beat him eight dozen times. Not eight times, eight dozen lashes. The hum after the humiliation, he left that ship and went on to the Pegasus, a slave ship. Unfortunately, he didn't get along with that crew either. And by the time they got to West Africa, instead of buying slaves, he was sold into slavery. He worked alongside the African Amer Africans who lived there as a slave in a household of a white master. Well, a sea captain from Britain came and took him along with him, freed him from his slavery. On their way back to Britain, however, outside of Ireland, they encountered a large storm. The ship nearly went down. He prayed, Lord, save us. Thankfully, the ship was carrying beeswax, cotton, and carrying also some tea. The, the cargo shifted, plugging the hole of the ship, and the ship did not go down. It drifted to Britain. After this, he came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. The Spirit was working throughout all this time. The whole time heading back to Britain, he spent praying, reading God's Word, reading other Christian literature. Unfortunately, he continued on in the slave trade, though. At first, he was a first mate of a ship, following then to captain his own slave ship, going back and forth to West Africa, bringing African citizens to be made slaves of the English people. This lasted for six years until he was, had a stroke. Unfortunately, he continued to support that slave industry by sending money and investing in the ships. It took 34 years. 34 years after that stroke, he came out and spoke against slavery. He joined forces with William Wilberforce, and if you know that name, you know that he moved and worked and, uh, and led the parliament to uh, abolish slavery. John Newton wrote of his own self that the, uh, the conditions of the slaves were deplorable. The way that they treated them were inhumane. 34 years, though, the Spirit had to work on him. The Spirit kept working on him. And he became an Anglican priest, and he wrote those words, Amazing Grace. When you hear his biography, I suspect that many of you realize that those words were as much written for us today as they were written for his own heart. But that's not exactly what I want you to focus on this morning. I want you to focus on the calling of the Lord. The calling of the Lord for John Newton. 
Calling Him from that slave trade. Calling Him from that life of pain and suffering. Calling Him to be His servant. To write those beautiful words. To, to shepherd His people. He called Him and even, even John Newton in his own words called Himself despicable and what they did is despicable. But God called Him. And God used Him. And used Him in some amazing ways. And I want you to focus on that because that takes us back to our gospel lesson for this morning. In our gospel lesson this morning, we have the calling of four men, don't we? Simon and Andrew, James and John. Now, they did not know Jesus as we know Jesus, did they? We know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, but they didn't yet. They might have known him as the Messiah, the promised one, because that's who John said he was. They might have encountered him along the way, but they didn't yet know him as Savior. That was yet to come. They didn't yet know him as the one whose blood would free them from their sins, setting them free to live with them forever. But they followed him. They listened to the call of the Lord. This itinerant preacher, this prophet, they followed him. They trusted him. They stepped out in faith. They took a leap of faith. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because in that leap of faith, They were set free. Now I want you to go back to those slave ships for a moment here. Those slaves were kept in the hold of the ship and they were locked in and they did not see the light most of the time that they traveled. Imagine those slaves as they were bound back to back, barely any leg room to, to move, to stretch out their legs. If the captain was in a good mood, they'd get bread and they'd get water. But most of the time the captain wasn't in a good mood. In fact, in in that day and age, If 50% of the so-called cargo made it safely, then that was good. Now imagine that hatch opening, light streaming in below the deck, and the words that you have been set free. Because that's what happened when Jesus came to the disciples, when he came to Peter and James and, and Andrew and John. When he came to them, they were set free. When he came to us, he set us free. In the calling of Jesus Christ, we are set free. We are called to be part of His kingdom. We are called to be His children. And we are called to be free from our sin. Not free from God, but free to follow God. Free to walk in His paths. A little bit later, in John, he actually says that, I tell you the truth. Everyone, this is Jesus' own words, by the way. I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Beautiful words of our Savior, aren't they? Beautiful words to know that we have been set free. Free to be the children of God. It's as if when Jesus called the disciples, he said, I will use your talents and your abilities and the gifts that I have blessed you with And I will use them that you might serve me, that you might carry out my will in the world, that you might be my hands and my feet, that you might be my voice to those who are lost and dying. He called them that they might go out. And now imagine for a moment those disciples. The Bible never gives us their age, does it? It never tells us how old they were, but we know that they must have been old enough to be working the ships, some of them on their own. And imagine being called from your livelihood. Being called to take that step of faith, that leap of faith. Step out of your comfort zone. Step out of that attitude. We've always done it this way before. Step out and trust God. Because that's what God's call means. He is calling us out of what is comfortable. He is calling us out of the status quo. That which the world expects. And He's calling us to be a light to the world. To pierce the darkness of sin. To reflect His great love to those in our lives and the world around us. That was a call he made to the disciples and the call he makes to each of us. I don't know if you often think about the calling of the disciples, but I think sometimes we think only 12 disciples were called. Only 12 disciples were, were, follow, were called to follow him. But if you thumb through the pages of the Gospels, you know that more than 12 were actually called. That there were a great many disciples called, but some of them, they, they weren't willing to trust the word of God. They weren't willing to take that leap of faith. They were scared. Some of them, they, 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 they heard what Jesus had to say, and they said, the teaching is too hard for us. 
what I love in John chapter 6. It's right after one of such times. And Jesus says to the disciples, you don't want to leave me too, do you? And you have this confession of faith by Peter. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. You have the words of eternal life. What a strong confession that Peter makes. A confession of faith. A confession of trust. A confession of confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I wonder, do we have such boldness in our confession? Do we share that same boldness of Peter? The outspoken the disciple. The one who said to Jesus that I will follow you wherever you go. Who was strong enough and then turned back, but still outspoken. Is our confession of faith one that people not only hear, but they see? Is our confession of faith one that when we speak, people hear the voice of Jesus Christ? When not we use our hands and our actions, do people see Jesus at work in the world? Is our confession of faith one that people identify us as Christian people, followers of Christ? I suspect for many of you, so the answer is sometimes. We will give ourselves a little credit. We know we're not perfect, but we know that sometimes we're, we're pretty good. Sometimes we're faithful. We're good about being in church on Sunday. Sometimes we use wholesome language, except for when we smash our finger with a hammer or stub our toe on the couch or when somebody really irritates us or frustrates us. But sometimes we're good about helping others in need. Well, seeing someone who needs an extra helping hand and reaching out to help them. Sometimes. Sometimes, right? We're pretty good. And according to our scale, we're pretty good. The problem is, is pretty good ain't good enough. Say that again. Pretty good ain't good enough. God's standard is perfection, not pretty good. Not you're almost there and uh, don't worry, I will cover it the rest of the way. But God's standard is perfection, and all but perfection leads to death, eternal death. And that's why God's grace is so amazing. That's why the grace of God is so amazing, because Christ found us while we were yet sinners, while we were dead in our trespasses. Christ entered into our world, and he entered into our lives, and he entered into our hearts, and he called us from the darkness of our sin, and he set us free from the slavery of death. And he has called us to be his very own sons and daughters, children of God. He has called us imperfect disciples, and he has made us his own. And he has called us not to a, a life of this world, but a life of promise. A promise that will be with him in the next. A promise that no matter what happens in this life, that we have hope and confidence. The co message of the gospel, the call of the gospel, was not for those who were perfect. Let's look at those disciples again, the twelve that stuck with Jesus. Well, if we go to the night in which Jesus was betrayed, when he was drugged before the Sanhedrin, when he was mocked and flogged, when he was drugged before Pilate and eventually hung on the cross, how many of the disciples trusted him? How many of the disciples' faith stayed strong and steadfast? I'll give you a clue. You don't need any hands or any fingers because the answer was zero. And yet on the cross, Jesus showed amazing grace and forgave them of their sins. And he shows us amazing grace and forgives us of our sins. Even when we wander from him, even when, our call, when we ignore his calling, even when we don't listen to his voice, in grace, according to his amazing grace, he calls us. In love and compassion, he calls us. And he calls us from that darkness of sin that we might be his witnesses to the world. That we might be those who reflect his bright shining light that we might be those who when we hear his call know that it is a call to be with him forever. And that is what amazing grace is. The amazing call of Jesus on our hearts and our lives to be his sons and daughters. Not a one of us is perfect, but each one of us are made perfect in Christ. As we have been baptized into his name, washed and made clean, and one day we will see that full, full meaning of that perfection when we join him in eternal life. When Jesus calls, make sure you listen. Amen.